hardly speak peace so unexplainable I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into Welcome to Village 7 Presbyterian Church Worship Service. We're glad that you're joining us online, that you're a part of us. One of the things we want to try to do during this time is to make sure that we connect with one another. So if you've not been a part of one of our community Zoom classes, I would encourage you to join one and be a part of it and be able to see people that you know and hear their voices and be a part of that. We also want to consider how can we love the city where we live? And one of the ways we want to do that is by acknowledging um, some of the teachers. Uh, we have a relationship with Penrose Elementary School right down the road. We've done service projects there before. And so what we'd like to do is to honor the teachers and the staff by providing a Dash Door uh, gift card. So you can go to our link and where it says Give Now, and you can participate in that, and you can write to Michelle at v7pc.org, and she'll give you a name of a teacher or a staff person, and then you can write them a note of encouragement. Now let us call ourselves to worship. Shout to the Lord all the earth. Come before his presence. Come with a joyful song. Know that he is our God, and we are his people. Let us worship the Lord together. Romans 8, 18 through 25. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Maker, 
we sing to our God. All creatures of our God and King, we lift up your voice and with us sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam. the blessed God, source of happiness in thy creatures, my maker, benefactor, proprietor, upholder. Thou hast produced and sustained me, supported me, saved and kept me. Thou art in every situation able to meet my needs and miseries. May I live by thee, live for thee, Never be satisfied but as I resemble Christ and may conformity to his principles, temper, and conduct grow hourly in my life. Let thy unexampled love constrain me into holy obedience and render my duty my delight. Keep me walking steadfastly towards the country of everlasting delights, that paradise land in which my true inheritance support me by the strength of heaven, that I may never turn back or desire false pleasures that will disappear into nothing. As I pursue my heavenly journey by thy grace, let me be known as with no aim, but that of a burning desire for thee. And the good and salvation of my fellow men. When I'm afraid of evils to come, comfort me. Comfort me by showing me that in myself I am a dying, condemned wretch. But in Christ, I am reconciled and live, that in myself I find insufficiency and no rest, but in Christ there is satisfaction and peace, 
that in myself I'm feeble and unable to do good, but in Christ I have ability to do all things. They now I have his graces in part. I shall shortly have them perfectly in that state where thou wilt show thyself fully reconciled and alone sufficient, efficient, loving me completely with sin abolished. O Lord, hasten that day. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleasing that I'm never
Every week when we do confession, uh, we are reminded that God's grace is so great, and yet our sin is still there. Romans 8 reminds us that, one, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It also reminds us that the Holy Spirit speaks to our spirit that we are the children of God. And it also speaks of the hope that we have because God's love is a certain thing and it's an internal thing. And it, but the reality is, oftentimes, we do not live that way. Oftentimes, we instead, we live as orphans with God. And so I want you to take a moment and just think about ways in which you live your life, not in the reality of the gospel, but in the falsehood that you are not loved by the Lord. I'd love to give you this insurance from Romans 8 as well. Three words, three passages. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings and too deep for words. And then know in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things in the future nor powers, no height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord.
please pray with me. Father, we do thank you that you love us with an unending love, that you have made us your children, that you made us your own, that we have a love that can never be taken away. And Father, we do ask that because of this love that we would be light and salt in the world that you've given us, that we would be your people reaching out to those around us where we live, work, and play. Father, we do pray for the first responders that you would keep them safe. We pray for the government that you'd give them wisdom. And we pray for our teachers that you'd give them perseverance in doing their job in a very difficult and and different way. And Father, among all things, we do pray and ask that your kingdom come and your will be done even during these difficult times. May we delight in you and may you shine forth through us to Colorado Springs, the West, and the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hello, my name is Mark Bates. I'm one of the pastors here. And during this season, we are going through one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, Romans chapter 8. And that text has been read for you already. We'll be looking at verses 18 to 25, uh, but you'll want to have that passage open uh, before you. When I was in high school, my parents bought a third car so that my sister could have a car to drive and I would get to use it occasionally. And uh, they wanted something more affordable and hopefully reliable, and they got a Chevy Monza. And so the Chevy Monza, when we first got that, I remember uh, how excited I was because this car was just a little bit sporty. It, um, it was a, a fun car to, to look at, and I was thinking about all the freedom that I would have. No longer would I have to depend on my parents to take me places. No longer would I have to wait for friends to pick me up. I could go where I wanted to go, whenever I wanted to go, and do whatever I wanted to do within reason. Well, we first got the car, and it was a lot of fun. We, uh, we enjoyed driving it, but very soon, uh, problems began to present themselves. And uh, one problem was that it was powered by the little engine that could not. Uh, the engine did not have enough energy, and so whenever you're going up a big hill, uh, it would start to slow down, and you felt like you had to do the Fred Flintstone thing, where you push your feet through the floorboard and begin to kick. But that wasn't the worst problem. The worst problem was the car was totally unreliable. It would break down all the time, leaving me stranded at the uh, most interesting of places. One time, I was going up a hill, the accelerator cable broke. Suddenly, instead of going forward, I'm going backwards. And uh, it just, uh, constantly these things were happening. My friends joked that I pushed that car more miles than I drove it. The car held such promise. It um, and sometimes it delivered on the promises. It, it promised uh, that it would get me from point A to point B. It promised freedom. And at times it delivered on those promises. But as soon as I thought I could count on it, it would fail. Something would break. Well, life on planet Earth is a lot like driving a Chevy Monza. Uh, it holds such promise. It delivers on those promises sometimes. But it will always break down. Now, I hate to be Johnny Raincloud, but as soon as we get through this crisis, maybe even before that, something else is going to go wrong. Hopefully, it won't be another global pandemic, but something will go wrong, something will break. It could be an illness or an injury. It could be something with your family or with your job. Uh, Something is going to go wrong, and you'll be frustrated, and you'll be thinking, if only I could get this one problem fixed, then I would be happy. In fact, we probably said that about the pandemic. Like me, you probably said, I, I just want things to get back to normal. But we really don't just want things to get back to normal. We want to live in a world that is right. We want to live in a better world. In verse 18, the Apostle Paul says that the present sufferings of this present age are not worthy of being compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now that is a remarkable statement. He says that the sufferings of this present age that seem like a grand canyon of pain to us are not worthy to be compared. They'll look like a crack in the sidewalk compared to what God has for us in glory. 
Now you may think, well, maybe the Apostle Paul had an easy life. Maybe he didn't know about the hardships that you have suffered. But here's a man who was beaten, shipwrecked, stoned, left for dead, despised by his own countrymen. This is a man who knew suffering. And yet he could say with great confidence that the glory ahead is even greater. And so that leaves us with with two questions. First of all, why do we live in a world in this present age where there is such suffering? What's wrong with this world? And what is the glory that lies ahead for us? So let's begin. Why is the present age full of suffering? Why is the present age full of suffering? Now, we have to begin by acknowledging uh, that the world that we live in is a beautiful world. From the majesty of the mountains, to the expanse of the ocean, to the amazing variety of the wildlife that we get to see, everywhere you turn, you see beauty and glory and majesty. It's also a world full of abundance. I mean, our world produces uh, such wonderful food that we get to enjoy that is not only for our nourishment, but simply for our pleasure, for our delight. We live in a world that's both pleasing to the eyes and pleasing to the palate. Yet at the same time, this world that gives us such beauty and delight also is a world that gives us such pain and suffering. Many of us remember a few years ago when the Waldo Canyon fire ravaged through, followed by the Black Canyon fire. We've seen that the flooding come down into Manitou. We watch on the news and we see a world of of famine, of drought, and of course a world full of disease. We live in a world that is is broken and even though it's beautiful, it's still deadly. It's, it's sort of like you know, the island in Jurassic Park. It's, it looks like a beautiful place to live, and it would be if it weren't for the man-eating dinosaurs. It's a beautiful place, but it's broken. Why is it this way? Well, when God created the world, it was all very good. But as Paul says in verse 20, we read that God himself intentionally subjected creation to futility. It's as if God made the world very good and then he intentionally broke it. He made the world without flaw, without error, and then he sort of messed the thing up. Now, why would he do such a thing? Well, Paul tells us in verse 21. He says, he did it, quote, in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. God did not subject creation to bondage and decay in a fit of anger, but rather he did it for the purpose, for the goal and hope of, for this end goal, for this result, that it would ultimately result in the the liberation of creation and the salvation of his people. God did not do it out of frustration. He did it with the goal of salvation. Now, to understand this, we have to go back and we have to remember how we got here. The world was not always broken. When we read in Genesis chapter 1, after each day of creation, God said, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then when he finished the whole thing, he said, it is very good. And so God created a world that was not broken. When God created the world, he did not create a lemon. He created a a beautiful, life-giving world where there is no sin, no evil, no disease, no destruction. God then created human beings in his own image to reflect his majesty and his beauty and his glory. And he bestowed on human beings this incredible honor and dignity of being his rulers, his representative rulers over all creation. He gave us the earth to steward and to enjoy. Yet rather than reigning over the earth as God's royal representatives, uh, humanity rebelled against God. Now that's what happened when Adam ate of the forbidden fruit. When Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, he was rejecting God's authority. He was saying, you do not have the right to tell me what is right and wrong. I will decide for myself what is right and wrong. I will be my Lord. I will be my master, not you. He rejected the Lord as king. But here's the problem. We cannot live without God any more than an infant can live without its parents, any more than plants can live without sunshine. And so God subjected the created order to frustration because to be separated from God is death. So God subjected creation to decay in order to give us a taste of what the world would be like without him. He said, you want to see what life is like without me? It disintegrates. It's destruction. 
By subjecting nature to futility, with all of its pain and all of its destructiveness, God is giving us a very tangible, visible image of what life is like apart from him. So in those moments of beauty, in those moments of well-being, we see what the world would be like if we were under God's reign and under his gracious rule. But when we experience pain and sorrow and suffering, uh, these are like signposts of where we're headed eternally if we continue on with life without God, life separated from God. Now, we tend to think of pain and suffering as a curse. No one likes pain. And yet pain actually is a gift. If you, uh, if you stub your toe on a rock, that pain is a symbol, a sign to you that you're doing damage to your body. If you touch something that's warm and you, you pull it back, that pain that you feel is saying you're doing something wrong, you're doing something destructive. And the pain and the suffering that we experience in this life is, is a reminder that our world is off course, that man cannot live without God. Uh, it's, there's something that is terribly wrong. So our dissatisfaction with the world as it is, is actually a good thing because it causes us to long for a better world. You know, John Calvin put it this way. He said, our souls will never seriously rise to the desire and contemplation of the future life until they've been soaked in scorn for this present life. He's saying as, as long as we think we can find happiness in this present life and life without God, we're going to pursue that and we'll never turn to God which ultimately will lead us to death. And so foolishly, though, even after the world disappoints us again and again and again, like that old Chevy Monza breaking down again and again and again, we keep thinking maybe this time it will satisfy us. And so Calvin goes on to say, said, even when overcome by life's miseries, we barely manage to stop staring at the present life with depraved and stupid admiration as if it contained within itself the sum of our greatest goods. The way a friend of mine put it, it's like we're always going to the hardware store in search of bread and we continually come home disappointed. The world will not satisfy us. Instead, we must recognize that even though this world offers us much that is good, much that is beautiful, much that is delightful, ultimately, apart from God, it cannot satisfy us. It, it, it cannot satisfy our heart. And so uh, it's that Paul says then, we, we join in groaning. Notice he uses that word groaning three different times. So that's, that's how we are in this present age. We are people who are groaning. Now that word that he uses for groaning is the same word that is used in the, in the book of Acts to speak about the Israelites groaning as slaves in Egypt. It is a, it is a deep agony a deep pain and, 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 uh, that you're subjected to because you're in the pain of the frustration of a broken world. So it's appropriate that as we live in this present world that we groan and we lament. It, you know, we ought to be a people who lament. There are people who say, you know, just you know, trust God. God's in control. It's okay. That's all true. God is in control. He does have the world under control, but it's still a time for lament. It's still a time for sadness. It's sad that people are dying. It's it's, it's grievous that people are getting sick. It it is tragic that people are losing jobs and income and even other things that that some may think are trivial but are not trivial at all. That some kids are missing out on their graduations, their, their junior prom. They don't get to play their spring sports. Their life has been so disrupted that things they've looked forward to for years have suddenly been torn away. We live in a world of groaning. We live in a world that is suffering. So lament and groaning are proper responses to the world as it is now. Yet even in our groaning over the brokenness, we groan with those who have hope. So why should we have hope? Why should we have hope? Now, the third, one of the times, verse 22, that Paul uses the word groaning, he uses the word to speak of the groans of a woman in childbirth. I've been in the room for all the birth of all three of my children. There is uh, it's a painful sound. It's painful to watch. It is, uh, it is something that, is, uh, that you will never forget. Yet even as a woman is groaning in the pains of childbirth, 
there, there's this note of hope. The woman groans in pain, but she also you know, has this, this joy of anticipation because, because there's a baby that is going to come about from this. The, the pain is joyful because there's a child that is to come. And the same is true of creation. It is groaning, but at the same time, in verse 19, Paul says that creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. It says, and here it has this personification of creation. It has creation. It's like it's, it's long, it's on tiptoes, and it's looking to the horizon, looking for that day when the sons of God are revealed. Or it's like, you know how children are at Christmas time, their grandparents are coming for a visit, and they're looking out the window, anxiously waiting their arrival. And he says that's what creation is doing. It's longing for the arrival. Now, there are, are some uh, who think that God is going to destroy the earth and start over, but that does not fit with this imagery. Creation is not groaning and looking forward with eager anticipation to its destruction, to its annihilation. Rather, what Paul says is creation is looking forward to its liberation from decay. So what we see is that, that when we talk about the new heaven and new earth, that God is taking the earth and he's making all things new. Remember in Revelation 21, Jesus did not say, I've come to make all new things. He said, I've come to make all things new. Jesus, when he spoke about the, uh, the new earth, the new creation in Matthew 19, he uses a Greek word, palingenesia. And that word palingenesia means to regenerate, to be born again, or to be made new. It's the word for regeneration or born again. It's the same word that Paul uses in Titus to describe Christians who've been born again. And so when you're born again, God didn't obliterate the old you. No, he made the old you a new you. He gave you a new heart. He gave you the Holy Spirit. You are a new creation, but you're still you. And that's what God is doing with the world. One day he's going to make all things new. When that day comes, when Christ returns and he, he glorifies his people, uh, one day the evil will be destroyed. We'll live in a world of beauty without evil, joy without sorrow, delight without suffering. You'll, you'll swim in the ocean and not worry about the sharks or the jellyfish. You'll go out uh, to the, on a hike and not have to worry about getting sunburned or, or getting hurt. Uh, as, uh, as Isaiah says, that the wolf and the lamb will lie down together. The child will will play at the hole of a cobra. Uh, it will be a world where God wipes away every tear. No more sadness, no more grief, no more disease, no more death. God is going to make all things right in the world. Yet this liberation of creation is directly tied to the redemption of the children of God. Just as God promised to make all things new, he promises to make us new as well. As he says in verse 23, again, look at the word groan. He says, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. We are groaning in anticipation of that day, longing for that day when we're made new. We're longing for that day when we, we no longer struggle with the flesh. We no longer struggle with sin. Longing for that day when this body, which is already undergoing decay and falling down and breaking apart, is made new. We're longing for our redemption. And so he says we're groaning for that. And that's why the cross of Jesus stands at the center of God's cosmic act of redemption. It is only by his death uh, that we, who once were rebels against God, now are adopted as sons of God. And this adoption, as we saw last week, is not something that we earn or we deserve. It is something that God freely bestows on us as a gift, a gift that we receive by faith alone in Christ alone, because Jesus on the cross took away our condemnation of sin, and he gave us his righteousness, and then he gave us his Holy Spirit who brings us into the family of God by which we cry out, Abba, Father. We are loved by the Father. Now, Paul says here, though, we await our adoption. Earlier in the chapter, he says that we already have been given the spirit of adoption, and the question is, which is it? Did we, are we already adopted, or is the adoption something that is yet to come? And the answer is yes. 
Uh, and here's where the Bible, oftentimes we'll, we'll talk about things that are already and not yet. Already and not yet. Our salvation is already and not yet. At the very moment a person puts their faith in Jesus, he or she is justified before God. There is therefore now no condemnation at that moment. At that very moment, they're declared righteous by God, acceptable, beauty, beautiful, loved, and glorious before his presence. At that very moment, that person receives a new heart that has a desire to follow after God. They have this new nature. They also are given a new power. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us so that we have the power to live a life that is pleasing to God. All of that has already happened. And so in that sense, the moment you become a Christian, you are already saved. We can speak about, I was saved, I am saved as a past event. Yet, to state the obvious, our salvation is not yet complete. While we have a new nature, we still have to contend with what Paul calls the flesh. Uh, Our old sinful desires are still there. We still live in these bodies that are still subject to to decay and they're breaking down. And we still live in this world that is running down and subject to decay as well. And so we still await the completion of our adoption. We still await the the fullness of it. We we live in a world of already and not yet. And and where many Christians stumble is they have what some theologians call an an over-realized eschatology. Now, that's a term you can use to impress your friends. Overrealized eschatology. What we mean by that is eschatology is the study of the end times. And some have an overrealized idea that the end times should be fully realized now. And so they think, well, I'm a Christian. I'm loved by God. Therefore, that means I'm going to have my best life now. God's going to bless me. And because I'm God's child, there's not going to be pain or sickness or suffering. Life is going to go well. And, and frankly, there are many preachers on television peddling the sort of prosperity, the sort of health and wealth gospel. But Paul says here, he says, in this present age, there's suffering. And if you set yourself up to believe that because you're a child of God, you will not experience suffering in this present age, if you have that sort of overrealized eschatology, you'll be thoroughly disappointed. The, the, the end, the glory, is still to come. And we wait for it with patience, but we wait for it with eager anticipation. Now, earlier this week, um, one of our elders, Tom Griffin, uh, sent me a reminder about something called the Stockdale Paradox. It's named after Admiral Jim Stockdale. Uh, Admiral Stockdale was uh, the highest ranking prisoner at the Hanoi Hilton, the the prison camp uh, during the Vietnam War, and he was there for eight years. For eight years, he had no idea when he was going to get out. He was tortured 20 times during that imprisonment. He lived without any prisoner's rights, no set release date, no certainty if he would ever see his family again. Author uh, Jim Collins, in his book, Good to Great, asked asked, uh, Admiral Stockdale how he was able to survive. And here's what Stockdale said. He said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn that experience into the defining event of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. Imagine that. He says he would not trade what he went through. But then Collins asked him another question, very, you know, just a good question. He said, well, who did not make it out? Who did not survive the imprisonment? And here's what he said. He goes, oh, that's easy. The optimist. They are the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And then when they weren't out by Christmas, they said, we're going to be out by, by uh, Easter. And when they weren't out by Easter, they said, we're going to be out by Thanksgiving. And then another Christmas would, would roll around, and uh, they would be heartbroken, and they would die of a broken heart. Stockdale continued. He said, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they may be. Christian. That's how we live. We must confront the brutal facts of reality. We live in a broken world, a world of suffering, but that world points us to our need for God. And those who now have put our faith in Christ, we have this hope that one day he's going to make all things new. And when he does, and when he does, all the suffering, all of the hardship that you've endured in this life 
will not be worthy to compare to the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so Christian, press on, keep the faith, remain faithful because glory awaits. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for the hope that we have. Lord, we pray that you would give us the courage to face the reality of the hardship of life that we are now in. We pray that instead of looking for satisfaction in this world, that we look to satisfaction from you and in the life that is to come. We thank you for those things that we do get to enjoy, the beauty, the pleasures, the delights, for those good gifts that remind us of what is to come. But we pray that we would not set our hearts so much on this world that we do not stop longing for the world that is to come. And so, Lord, we pray, keep us faithful, keep us close. May we remember our hope that is in Jesus and him alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for joining us for our worship service today. Also, if there's anything that we can be doing for you, if you have prayer requests or you need assistance, I want you to know your church family is here for you. So on our website, there is a place you can click, a button you can push for urgent needs, prayer requests. Please let us know because we want to be caring for you during this time as we stand together as the body of Christ. Now receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.